Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Candid Crack. We have on the other side of the planet, well, halfway, Marion. How are you? I'm very well, sir. How are you doing? Very well. And we have Richard. Hello. How are you? I'm very good. It's been a, it's been a long week and I've still got Friday to come, but I'm still pretty good. <laughs> but people don't know that. They watch those videos random. So, um, but yeah, actually today it's a, it's a first day here in Hong Kong. Uh, Marion, maybe describe a little bit before we start um, what you, well, not what you do, that's the second part, but uh, who you are uh, and a little, a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Okay. Uh, so I'm Marion Gravel. Uh, I'm a recovering chief people officer or HR director in Old Money. Um, and I've... Uh, decided to take some of the stuff I've been working on for the last 30 years within organisations uh, out to try and spread that uh, that message and uh, those sorts of uh, that level of thinking to uh, to new organisations to help them get stronger. Okay. Um, and what about the second part as well? I, can, I, I think we kind of sort of switched it around, but um, tell me a little bit more about know your previous job then uh, and what you actually do right now right okay so I, i've 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 left uh, the world of uh, cpo dem um i've been around sort of seven or eight different industries uh and the most recent was uh, was food manufacturing and prior to that um traffic wardens uh, and therefore at that time i had the most hated workforce uh, in the uk um and as you can imagine you learn a fair bit about engagement and behaviours when your workforce have on average 400% uh, of uh, prison officers uh, daily physical attacks put upon them. So um, that was a a sobering, uh, wonderful um, and very educational time for me. Uh, so that that I didn't know about you, Marion. So yeah. um, I mean, yeah, that that in itself is is worthy of, a, of an interview. But um, if you could just if you could really just summarise that and say, look, what what was it that was inspirational and and, and deep learning in that? You know, that because not many people are going to have that kind of experience. So anything that you just sticks there that that is what is you know what what should everybody know about that? Yeah, sure. Well, um, uh, what, what everyone should know is that everyone needs to do a job. And if you don't uh, enforce traffic restrictions, you get traffic chaos. And suddenly you can't uh, take your kids to school because traffic is, uh, it, it is it's horrific. But, you know, within the UK, at least, uh, it was fair game to, uh, to abuse those, those guys. So within that part, we knew we needed to give those guys a purpose. Uh, and the purpose is not to whack a ticket on a car to generate a fine. Uh, it's to help the communities uh, thrive uh, and, and access to shops, etc. cetera, was, uh, was, was a key. It's ironic that in a post-COVID world, that is less so. So getting that purpose was, was key. We also randomly acquired a, uh, a non-emergency passenger transport business. We thought it was a transport business, funnily enough, turned out to be a care business. So we had to get our heads around two sets of workforces. One was doing nasty things. The other one was doing really cool things about taking vulnerable adults to, uh, to hospitals, etc. And suddenly we, were, we, we needed to understand what their purpose was, which is far more vocational, and bring that in to the core business. So it was a fortunate collision of cultures that helped and extended this idea of community and doing good for the community and um, the the tasks and all of the sub-elements within that uh, need, need to lead up to that purpose. And, and that's what led to my interest in um, uh, Greg Bateson's and Robert Diltz's uh, logical ladders uh, around, um, yes, you need to understand what your capabilities and your beliefs are, um, but they only really make sense if you have a real identity, uh, a real view of your identity and, the, and purpose. And so that, well, I, I was doing that practical stuff first, and I've ended up finding the theories and the, and the logic behind why it was successful. Uh, and that was very fortunate. So, yeah, 
but we can, as you as you can imagine, we can we can talk at 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 at, at, at length about uh, traffic wardens. I mean, I, I think perhaps that there's there's this, it at least gives us uh, ways to sketch out what you're talking about when 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 you explain some of the, the theoretical uh, intellectual work you're doing. I mean, going back to traffic wardens and turning you know th that that most hated profession and and how do you give them purpose and meaning and identity? You know that that's that will be really interesting. So so you know keep, if you can keep that in the back of your mind as as yeah. that that's something. If you've got a story, I think everyone's going to go, wow, great. Um, but, but first of all, yeah, let, let's just explore that intellectual model that you, you just mentioned. Yeah, what what actually are these ladders, and, and, and what's the model? Right. So when, when you go back to um, Greg Bateson, who's an anthropologist, um, and his original logical le levels work, um, it, it's all good stuff. Um, but I think what Robert Diltz has done under the NLP banner is to uh, is to s simplify it, and and, and I've been a bit naughty and maverick in that I've, I've amended the, the, the layers for, for them to make, make sense uh, for themselves. But essentially, you would take a, um, uh, uh, a, a Deng Xiaoping view of you feel your way across a river through stepping on different stones. Some of them are invisible. So the, the, the stones here would start and you can, you can either build, build this as a ladder going up or you can build this as a as a as a planet or the Earth, where you're where you're going into more of the, of the core deep stuff. But essentially, you start with your environment. You know, wh where are you today? Um, and that's either literal uh, or a bit more um, vague in terms of you know, where am I today? Uh, what is my environment? What I'm, what am I feeling? So you you would you would then want to to think about your capabilities. So what are my skills? What are my attributes? What am I good at? What am I less good at in operating in this environment? Next step. Um, okay, so I've got these skills. So how do I behave? Um, and and, and, and the it's the behavior piece that I've added into uh, the work that um, uh, the LSI work, a company called uh, Humanistic Synergistics uh, have, have done on four common behaviors. But if you carry on with the step path of behaviors, what, what, is, what is beyond behaviors, you would say? Well, you're then into beliefs. I tend not to use values because values have been uh, hijacked and, and, and abused and uh, normally call to shiny posters on the wall, often with eagles soaring above um, beautiful um, uh, landscapes. Um, so what do I believe? What makes me angry? Uh, what, what am I drawn to? And uh, how secure am I in my beliefs that, let me, that enable me to change the steps behind me, including uh, my, my behaviours? Last couple of steps, we're nearly there. Um, so up, 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 above, uh, up, up, above the belief stuff, you're then into identity. Um, and this is where listening to, to Becky um, talk about the, the different world views has really been informative. So who am I? Who, where do I come from? Um, what, what generational aspects do I need to, to, to use and define in, 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 in my identity? Um, and then the, the big one, purpose. Um, so Daniel Pink's book, Drive, talks about a map, uh, mastery, autonomy, and purpose, autonomy being, being intermingled with accountability. Uh, and that map, he suggests, is one where we can really engage with, with ourselves and with our colleagues. So if we get our purpose right, and there's some spiritual aspect of this to, to those who have, uh, or have faith or, 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 or not, like myself. So at the highest level of, of abstraction, I've got my purpose right. And so if you're a traffic warden, if your purpose is about community, is community enablement and protection, then that then can cas cascade back down. As I'm walking back along these, these stones, um, I can then walk back from a position of a safe purpose into identity, uh, in, into my uh, beliefs, capabilities, uh, uh, my, 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 my skills and the environment I'm in. So, that, that, that's a, 
it's a long rambling way of, of explaining the, the 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 power of abstraction and getting right up to the, the purpose level uh, and, and then bringing it back down uh, stronger because of that experience so yeah i mean that so so you've synergized a couple of things here uh, and and so 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 Bateson and dilt's work and then the lsi stuff you sort of synergized it into into a dare I say, perhaps a more complete whole based on your experiences. And, but you've also got this, this, this dual purpose walking. So it's not, it doesn't get designed at the top and then you've got to find people who fit. There, there's, a, there's a pathway from the bottom upwards uh, and then in a, a reflection back down to the bottom again. Um, I mean, that, that's fascinating in itself. It's not usual in, in lots of workplaces. And I, um, how, how did that, work in practice that that dual motion so um, at an individual level it's relatively easy because you can do some visualization work with them so um yesterday's um di the, the dialogue session with uh, dr so eager um the, the way she got us to um visualize and and, and think about how how we are um kind or not kind to ourselves was pretty similar so at an individual level, um, you, you get individuals or, or teams to walk through these, uh, these steps um, and, and you ask them to, to visualize and think about the colors and the sounds and, and, and everything that's going on within each of these um, stepping stones. And back to Alexis's narrative, once you get people to, to start thinking and, and talking about their own narrative, and the way they represent themselves at each step. Um, as you're going up the ladder, you, it's a journey of discovery and a, a sense making of where I am today. On the way back down, you now have this superpower of uh, my, my purpose and, and my identity. And as you walk back down this visualize exercise, um, a, a, a partner would be would be scribing your your past and new experience. So you end up with an individual value proposition to yourself, essentially, and the value stuff plays into the, the behaviors element. Now, how do you fit that to the organizational piece? I suspect the error that we've made in the in the, in the West is to say, right, well, let's do something like that for an organization and let's get a common single set of values and capabilities and beliefs. And that's where it's begun to go all wrong because suddenly the individual is being squeezed out because you have to have, uh, comply with a very homogenous view of the company's purpose and behaviors, etc. Now, bits of that have to be um, common. You have to be operating in a in, a, uh, in an environment for a company, a certain market segment, uh, or, or however you define your market. Um, and you need to have a purpose behind that in order to serve the customers you want to. Um, and I think those common aspects can align with difference at, the, at an individual level, but elsewhere you have to show that, that it will be, and you need difference, you need cognitive, diversity. You need diversity in every every sense of the word. And so the, the work at a company level would be to say, yes, some elements of the ladder have to be homogenous, but some other elements have to be diverse. And this is where your influence, Richard, on, on irony is coming. The big irony I think I've got is that in order to get divergence and diversity across each of the steps, I think we need common behaviors in order to act in a constructive way to use the LSI terminology, to release diversity um, and, and, and open up ourselves to be ourselves and be more diverse uh, within companies. So that's the, that's the irony. It, it, there's a, there's a, I think there's a common route in through four common constructive behaviors. And if we do that, then we can release diversity uh, and, uh, and, and difference and positive difference across the business, that should lead to more mastery, autonomy, and purpose at an individual level. 
So that, that's how the synthesis stuff stuff works, I think. Well, that's, that's so. Yeah, I mean, you're you're, you're talking here to, uh, I guess, one of one of my big interests: the the the, the cynical or the ironic response to values pasted on a wall, uh, and then the, the the idea that that a successful large organisation um, can find people across the planet who who align very strongly with those values, and by doing so, that they create a culture that creates strong performance, which I don't think is supported by research in the slightest. Um, uh, and you're you're playing around with that and saying, well, okay, how much of this is is something that glues us together, mm. and how much of this is it needs to be diverse in order to create the dynamic way of working that that's going to create value? Uh, is that a fair is that a fair way of summarising? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very much so. And and hopefully, as we begin to shed some of the nineteenth and twentieth century bureaucratic shackles. And we, we start getting into and recognizing that we're going to be far more self organizing as teams. Um, then you, you need that, that intent, that commander's intent, that purpose. You do need that glue to bond us together. What's going to replace bureaucracy or some aspects of bureaucracy um, it, it is that common view. But within that framework, you, 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 have, to be, you have to be diverse. So that, um, one of the um, I think Ashby's law of cybernetics, I'll, I'll, I'll badly misquote him, but the, 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 uh, if you have, it's the elements within the system, that it, it's the elements that have the most level of variability and flexibility. They're the elements that are going to shape the system that is around you. And therefore for the system to be adaptive and right, and adapt in the right way, you need um, flexible and powerful elements within, I mean, it's the interactions within that gets there. Um, so yes, it, 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 it's about harnessing the, the difference and the variability and enabling the variability to actually move around, interact and shape the system um, in the right way, or at least guide the system, nudge the system um, and, and, and see where the, the disposition of change is going to be so that you can you can push things along um, uh, through your interactions in, in the right way, rather than being constrained by bureaucracy, which ultimately will break, um, and then into and then you're into a catastrophic failure in the system. So there's yeah. probably a little bit of anti fragility in this, which I know very little about. So I, that that will be a, another aspect for me to explore is uh, is how how we can make our systems anti-fragile um, by, by, by having that positive plasticity and elasticity within it. Yeah, I mean, there's that, uh, I mean, you, you're, you're, you're talking about, in, from another perspective, creating conditions of biodiversity, um, we, we, you know, through, through some simple, really, in the, the way you framed it, some very simple rules about respectful uh, behavior and, and, and ways of dealing with different opinions. I mean, to an extent that the rule is so simple that, that speak like you're right, listen like you're wrong um, uh, throughout the organization in that respectful, respectful space in order that the organization can be adaptive to, to external environmental changes. And, and, you've, done, and you've done that in a, in a place where everybody hated the workers because of, which, which would have been fascinating, I'm sure. But I mean, again, is that, I mean, I've, got, I've gone even simpler, but it, it, is that even simpler dive something that, that resonates? Very much so. And, and, I, and I think that what enables the behaviors to become habits is that next step along the uh, the pathway that that next step in the river which is around your your levels of security and security so when you look at the the next step it's what do i believe how do i value myself and the core of lsi is around if i'm insecure i will operate in either a passive defensive or or, or aggressive defensive way because I've got stuff to protect. I've got I've got insecurities to manage. If you go up um, the, uh, the again the ladder towards self actualization and uh, a level of security, suddenly you 
it's okay to be wrong. In fact, it's good to be wrong because there's, it's, it's, it's learning. Um, so if I am um, self-actualized, and I use the term self-value, and uh, I'm still working on that, if I value what I do, and I am confident that I can have good relationships and achieve the stuff I want to, and that I'm partnering with my colleagues, I myself am growing, I'm growing them, and I'm encouraging everyone around me when they fail, when they succeed. I can deploy those four page behaviors, partnership, achievement, growth, and encouragement more easily because I'm now coming from a place, a belief system of self-value and security. And that, that, that's how the two steps support each other. The, um, you mentioned, uh, Marion, um, about uh, purpose quite a bit. Also, your previous uh, work, um, so there's individual purpose as well. Um, and the last thing you mentioned was more about how to sort of imagine this. So what I'm curious about, to kind of maybe explain a little bit more about how this would work in practice. And um, because from my own experience, everyone has a very different purpose. There's of course, maybe a comp company level, you have something, but how, so how do you start this process? Is, was it a process or how did you, I'm just really curious how that actually would work in your team. Okay, so um, back then I was doing these things separately um, and only as I've got older, I've realized that my, my job in life is no longer to think about new ideas, it's to put the ideas together. Um, so uh, Bandler in NLP talks very much about life's chemistry, it's about putting shit together and taking shit apart. So back then I was doing these things uh, separately. So you would take an individual uh, in a group setting uh, and you would walk them through these steps so that they self-discover where they are today on each step of the ladder. You would then get them to walk into uh, or step into a place of, uh, of purpose um, and you would ask them to, to add in some, some bells and whistles, some feel good feelings around that and uh, they would then step back. So this is a, an eyes closed visualization exercise. You would do it in twos and threes uh, and your partner or the two partners would help you articulate and, and scribe what you've got. The end of the exercise, you then got uh, a, a, a document where you can frame this, you know, where, where, where am I? In, in the round across these these activities, um, what I would now do is 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 then take them towards towards the behaviour element and really focus in on their their belief system and how secure they they feel uh, in their beliefs and that would then take them into why these four constructive behaviours are good and why the eight naughty behaviours are bad. Um, and, and, and that's, that's how I would, I would complete that exercise. That's very much at an individual level, uh, and you can do that with, with teams as well. The organizational discussion is a very different one. Uh, it's around finding which bits of the ladder need to be the same, and this is strategy work, this is understanding what environment the company needs to operate in or move to, or be, or be stronger in, um, and their, their purpose um, in, in doing that for the customers. It's the other steps, I guess, where you're gonna find the need to have a company uh, set of beliefs, which are good, sound belief system, but they're not going to succeed if they try and shoehorn the thousands of people into that belief system. They, that's where we will have to manage the difference uh, between the two. And, and that, that's an ongoing discussion, dialogue that you have with all the stakeholders. So I'm going to be, oh, Richard, anyway. one more I'm going to be a little bit skeptical, Marion Hayes. So, sure. so imagine, so you've done those exercises clearly with, with the team. Have you seen also what the impact was of, of doing this? So, so the impact is, is behaviors. 
Um, so you, you you tend to see around you people talking, uh, first of all, about the the negative red and green behaviours. So you people can get called out in meetings. Um, so you, you you can be you can be called out as being oppositional because you're not really listening to somebody else's ideas. You're very quick to judge, quick to criticise, and you're being oppositional. So suddenly there's, there, there's a language being used to call out positive and negative behaviours. Um, but in true sort of metric style, you can look at attrition rates uh, reducing. Um, you can look at absence levels. You know, the traditional HR metrics um, are, 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 are positive and I have a positive trend after these sorts of interventions. Now, there may be other stuff going on as well, um, but, but you, you, could, you could link at least um, correlation. Uh, my belief would be causality, if I can prove that, between a change in behaviours, a more, a more confident, uh, secure population, um, and the behaviours, and then uh, wh whether people stick around and whether people deploy discretionary effort when they when when they're still around it's yeah i mean i the, the way you're talking about it there's two things that are coming to mind so first of all is the encouragement of interpretation uh, and that and that interpretation could also be contested and that's fine um so you've got and, and this so this talks to me to i don't know if you've ever read joanne Mer martin's work where she talks about three different cultural forms uh, existing simultaneously. So there's, there's the integrated culture, the, the formal stuff. There are subcultures where there are agreed interpretations that might be departmental or team-based as to how do we have to behave with, within this. And then there are contested interpretations where people are still trying to work it out. I mean, was that what you were seeing happen in real time? All, all three of these manifest in, in real time? Yes. So we, with, with, within the and I, and I try to harness that. So the, the stuff I was saying, look, we really do need to have a common approach to this was the behaviours. So the, the, the way we figure this stuff out needs to follow a, a similar common set of constructive behaviours. Otherwise, we, we, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, so then, then, what you then what you're then able to do is to have a, a constructive way of disagreeing, uh, of interpretation. Um, and the act of being asked your view on the interpretation itself drove engagement. So yes, so there's a there's a common skeleton uh, infrastructure constraint of the behaviours, and the more um, widespread they are, then it, it then enables you to to, to meander off and disagree uh, and contest. Uh, sometimes with a conclusion um, to, to do that. So yes, I, I'll, I shall look. I shall look at that work. That that three-piece model uh, is, it seems very powerful. A powerful way of of combining the the the, the, the different way of doing business. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's extremely powerful. Um, and yeah, so so one of the things that, that I think would be a, a really nice metric to come out of this. And I wonder if you saw it, is better decision making. Uh, and if so, do, do you have any examples of, of that, that occurring? So I, I, I can point to um, leadership decisions, get, you know, getting better or um, being more consensual. So at, at, at that time, I was getting my head around the, re the, the reality that the, the most common significant factor in a decision being made and taken is the confidence of the advocate. And therefore you could have a dreadful idea or a dreadful um, proposition being uh, articulated by a very confident, very articulate individual. Um, and that is what drives um, decisions, often poor ones. So the once you start taking ego out and, and, and Jeff talks about this in terms of an egoless culture uh, decision making's decision making did get better because now we were looking at uh, what we really want to achieve here 
um, and how can we dissect the analysis and uh, challenge the ideas, but not come across in a very oppositional way. I'll stick with oppositional as one of the big, as one of the twelve. So you did see the the challenging of decisions options in a more constructive, egoless way. Um, what I can't do is point to to metrics around that, but I can point to to meetings and discussions um, which were more constructive brought in more divergent views and different ways of thinking um, and were slightly less tainted by, by ego. Yeah, and, and so the second thing that comes to mind is, is how far you've pushed this away from what I would call standard North American um, industrial organizational psychology where they're just looking at the traits and the behaviors and, and these external measurable kind of things. And, and you've got into a more of a psychoanalytic or clinical psychological approach of looking at identity and inner self and, and um, you know, the causes of people being defense, passive defensive or, or uh, is that a fair assumption? And, and if so, where did all that come from? Because it's not common so, to someone who's worked in HR in, in, in my no, experience. No, 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 no. And um, so you, you meet the system where, where it is. So you, 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 you have to use the language that is necessary and appropriate for, for, for doing that. And you know, people really are very interested in themselves. People are very interested in how teams work. And so the behavior stuff is, is an easy one to get into. Um, and I, I wouldn't dare be, be as pretentious and, uh, and highfalutin as I have been on this course, on this call, in some of the language I've, uh, I've used. But people are very interested in, uh, in behaviours um, because they see it every, every day. Um, so what, once you get people to, to call out you know, traits and types, um, then you're into that discussion. Um, the, the, the identity purpose stuff, um, you, I've, my experience, I've tended to do it and explain it later. So if you do this exercise of walking people up and down the stones, not the garden path, um, then, then they, they have that experiential um, experience. Uh, and then you explain it to them later if they're interested. Um, so uh, what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to avoid is what HR people are really good at, which is to sometimes bamboozle people with um, uh, with, with jargon, and I've been guilty of that uh, myself. Um, so, um, you know, a, a definition of a chief people officer is somebody who solves a problem you didn't know you had in a way you didn't understand. Um, and therefore we need to try and, you know, try and get rid of, rid of that. And I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody of sometimes using uh, overly complex language. You whether it was Einstein or somebody else, I don't. I, I, I might, might have been apocryphal. You you take a complex, you try and simplify it to the point of simplicity, but no more, um, and, and that's a difficult balance to uh, to uh, to get to. Um, so, and, and I know that that one of the the, the people you referenced in um, uh, when you were in, in the, the the dialogue you're going to do do with us. Uh, as an influence was Harry Stack Sullivan. So Harry, and, and, and this, this is where I this is where I find it quite interesting because he talked about problems with living. Um, that was a key key part of his work was there's these problems with living in people and 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 that that problem of living in 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 standard HR terms is that's a problematic person, let's get rid of them. Whereas everything you seem to be saying is, no, there's a problem with the system that's causing this problem with living and, and we can create really good employees out of all kinds of clay by, by further understanding them. And again, uh, you know, I, I, this is where I think HR should be going. I mean, it's magnificent, but I just wonder if you had much opposition in your career to that kind of, especially when you were more junior, to that kind of way of thinking. Well, when I was more junior, I was, um, I, was, I was the devil. So I was the one getting frustrated that line managers weren't firing people who weren't underperforming. Um, so I, so I, I, I've got the, uh, the, 
I'm I'm the zealous con self convert. So um, and, and, and and look, there are times where we just do not have the time to invest in an individual. They're miserable. We're miserable. Um, and let's let, let, let's make a constructive attempt to develop them up. But equally, then there comes a point where you need to, to move them uh, move them out. And again, the more honest and direct you are about the need to move a proportion of the population out, the easier it is to have discussions with line managers about investing time in the, in, in the others to get them better. So again, there's irony here. So the, 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 the more assertive you are about, about taking a few out, uh, the, more, um, the more payback, the more investment managers who are incredibly busy and incredibly uh, um, stressed uh, and have far shorter time scales than, than, than possibly uh, I would have. They are then willing to, to invest time in those individuals and the teams. And also you've given them the tools to do so. Um, this is no abstract concept. There, there, there are ways of putting these behaviors into performance management systems. Uh, so you can have meaningful conversations about people's security and their insecurities and practical ways of getting them to, to behave in a more page-like like manner. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't say that you're gonna save and be able to mold everybody. Um, but if you can be upfront about the, about the inability to mold, mold some, you are then getting more traction on the ability to manage more. And then you're getting into what's a manager for, um, and you know, part of that message needs to be um, how they develop, not just individuals, but, but team interactions, both within their teams and also across teams. You know, back to Jeff's stuff about um, the teams of 150, the Dunbar number, it, 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 it's how managers connect those teams together and help those teams help to make that connection. That's the manager's role in, in, in the future. I, yeah, go on, Oscar, you've got a question. Yeah, the, the, that last thing that you mentioned, right, about um, cross department, cross team um, co co collaboration. Um, do you mind to talk about that a little bit more? Because that's actually why I stopped. Um, or you talked about the individual and you talked about the organization, but what about team level? So, um, well, one of the advantages of, of this tool, this behavioral um, re review, is that you can do it at an individual team and an organizational level. So they are surveys and they're norm-based. So you can look at where you rank as an individual or where your team ranks, or where your organization ranks. So there's a norm group, uh, and you can see where you sit and what, what percentile you are in. So there are 12 um, traits, four positive, eight negative. And uh, you can see where you sit um, in a norm group across all, all of these. So at an individual level, you can sit down with, um, uh, with a person and walk them through their their report if you want to look at how effective a team is within and outside you can do that survey and and, and take that data in at a, a team level and then finally you can do essentially a, a, a behavioral cultural survey of the organization so is this organization very constructive uh, or de destructive and where are we against those, those elements? And it all depends on what the company wants to do. Ideally, you do all three at the same time. You never get the chance to do that. So one of the discussions you need to have up front is, do I, work, do I want to work at an individual level and get these individual habits in there? Or actually, where, 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 where's the fun at? Is it at a, at a team level? And, and, and how, how does this team compare to that? Uh, or you can go in macro and, and talk about, okay, as an organization, 
where are we strong, where are we, where are we weak? So the, the tool works at multi levels um, and you know, behaviors drive the emergent culture. So you are trying to nudge culture along the right path by amending behaviors. Uh, and, and those behaviors have to be the, the individual behavior and how that affects the, how the team functions and how the organization functions. So I always come back to the individual as the key means of change, but it's the behaviors that they, they deploy that causes the interactions, that causes the effectiveness of the team, that causes the effectiveness of the organization to rise. So I have a, a predisposition to go individual up. Um, that's not always the best way of doing it. So I have to, I have to fight that bias in me to do that. Uh, so I, want, I, I mean, it's fascinating the, the sort of, you know, the, this interweaving of individual and team and organization and, pro, and coming in at different levels and blah, blah, blah. Um, there's one thing you haven't talked about so far that, that I think is going to would have been a huge part of your job, and that is leadership. So it's the development of leaders. So to, to does this work at, at, at that level as well, or are you, are you using other models? Yes. So when, when I first started working with this, um, you know, competencies were, were, were king. Um, and I passionately believe that uh, the competency assessment, the competency-driven development was, was where, it, where it's at. Um, and behaviours just took over. Um, so you would get data back on... 360s for competencies and behaviors. Um, and you just you just saw far more value in, in behaviors. So, and I'm not I'm not for one minute saying we shouldn't develop leaders' competencies, um, but my, my pivot was around leadership development being around a behavioral transition. So if you identify individual leadership gaps against the four constructive behaviors and you got them deploying those behaviors more often. That's where the development aspect uh, was at. Lots of self-reflection, uh, lots of peer-to-peer -peer coaching. Um, habit formation comes from a cohort of, I went on the course with, um, uh, with Bill and now I'm, I'm, I'm coaching him uh, uh, on, on those changes. Um, so, there was, there was competency stuff in there, but you get the behaviors right, then you have a, an engine of curiosity about their own development, which comes from that. And, and is that because quite a lot of this development work and, and, and trait-based work within leadership is it's too fuzzy for my liking, because it's sort of always about, oh, here's your... You know, yeah, the, the, uh, the stuff that's MTI based, there's, there's no there's no bad behaviors there. So you've, you've talked about eight bad for good consistently, which is unusual because it's normally fluffy and fuzzy and, and, and all of these one. So 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 even at the leadership level, were you doing similar things? You know, were, you, were you actually looking at bad leadership behaviors and trying to fix them? So um, we we always powerful about this approach and what managers liked it, what it was quite well, quite direct and directive. I know what's good, I know what's bad. Um, and so at the same time, we were all battling with the hero leadership definition, which were impossible. Um, so we, we, we were getting managers to think about their poor competencies and trying to get them a little less bad and getting to competence but not excellence. So we were pragmatic about, okay, th this competency is poor and is a potential game changer for you, potentially career limiting. So, uh, but we were, so we didn't shy away from that, uh, but we were pragmatic about getting it to a level and not, and, and, and not beyond. Um, so so that, 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 that's where we, we sort of stopped in terms of that development piece um our our good bad discussion we, we we tended to spend more time within the behavior set because we have the data behind it um and uh, you know whilst it is a behavioral psychometric um i could say to people look i'm not mucking about here you you really do need to, to behave in these four ways 
uh, otherwise your performance will will fail. Um, I could I could then be a bit more um, forgiving in areas of of um, competencies and uh, leadership skills as such. You're drawing the attention to a a some of the stuff I teach in, in on the global MBA on on adaptive leadership styles and so, so right. the ability to shift between okay I need to command and control at this moment and then I now I need to motivate and now I need to to be this messiah kind of visionary person and then that you know this 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 ability to say the, the, the style is not me it, it, it's something that I I choose to use and inhabit. Um, so Simon Weston does, does stuff on that that space as well. But you're also you're drawing drawing to mind the 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 the, the, the clinical psychological work of um, someone like Ron Warren, where he goes look there are six there are six drivers of leadership and there are seven derailers of leadership. Um, and of course, if you've got all the derailers, you, it's impossible for you to alter your style because the derailers are just like they, they just freeze everything into place. So, were, were you seeing evidence of that as well in that sort of multiple styles, drivers, derailers, all that messiness, and, and, and playing yes. around with that? Yeah. So m- m- many words ago, I I I, I tried to uh, get into the oxyc world, and the oxycs that I was uh, dealing with, talking to then, were very much personality is is fixed or at least I heard them say it was fixed so I disappeared off onto into behaviors as a way of looking at things I can change um, now I return to my oxide colleagues and then they're far more talking about dynamic personalities um, and um, uh, sorry, uh, d- dynamic personalities and and the change if you ask people do personalities change they now say yes I'm, they're getting more like themselves every day so I stumbled across Ron's work fairly recently um, and one of the things I'll do with the next drinking dialogue is to show if you look at the LSI 12 naughty behaviors each of which has been individually researched and put, put them together so they're valid in, the, in and of themselves you then map on Ron's work, and of the 12, 10 fit uh, almost word for word. So I've read Ron's book and his work on um, using Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak as, as a real and a metaphor in terms of those derailers. Uh, it's fascinating that what he's found from a, a 360 psychometric personality element maps almost 100% to the LSI stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm very much interested in, uh, in understanding more about Ron's work um, because it, it, it further validates what I've seen within the, the behavioral context. And um, if, he, if he comes on the next Drinking Dialogue, that would be, that'd be great. I, I've heard him speak a couple of times and he has some horrific stats on healthcare errors and uh, aircraft um, uh, accidents, all of which derive from um, the personality traits and the behaviours of subordination versus dominance, um, and, and that's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I, I love his work because he he he, he yeah, it's it, it, it's that ability to to, to change the, the 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 derailers and then get you to become aware of the the, the, the these derailers and then. Yeah, so this is what a, this is what a good leader looks like, and this is how you have to adapt rather, rather than just this is you. There, there are ways of controlling your behaviour and ways of reflecting on your behaviour, and that we can move you into a much better leadership space. But I also understand, and, and it's really interesting for me that you're using these bad behaviours because I understand anyone doing that that deeper analysis of, of behavior where they're saying that there are some derailers, it's quite difficult to get heads of HR to buy it in because they don't want to upset um, senior people by saying, look, you're, you're a bit toxic or you're a bit rigid or you're a bit hostile or you, you, you defer too much and stuff like that. So, so it's really interesting that you, you see it and you've been playing around with this for so long. Uh, yeah. I've got another couple of questions, but I'll go back to Oscar to see if he's got something first. There. Um, the, the, the question, of course, I, I want to move t- towards, uh, uh, I think we, we, we spoke quite a bit about uh, your current practices and how you um, um, uh, implemented this and how you practice this, but also, uh, of course, looking forward a little bit. Um, so the path that you followed so far, so you went from um, 
you, you're very curious about the behaviors of people as well. But um, the practice that you have right now, how do you see that developing and evolving over, let's say, the next sort of two, three decades? Um, so I've, I've thought very much about the, the classic, the contemporary and the contextual. So there's lots of classic stuff that has worked and we shouldn't check that out um, with, with, uh, with the bathwater. The, the contemporary stuff, and, and, and that's where I'm becoming more and more interested in, in, in the contemporary stuff over the last few years. And by, by contemporary, we, with this, we're talking about thing as, things as modern as Aristotle. Um, the, 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 there's things out there that we've just forgotten and that we can, we can bring in. The contextual stuff is we may need to make stuff up brand new, which is specifically driven by the context of an organization. So the practices develop by being context specific and context driven. Um, and, it, and it's interesting, Richard, yeah, sometimes it's, it's difficult to sell in a, an approach to HR, far easier to talk to line managers because line managers like the idea of good, bad, yes, no clarity uh, and stuff that they can see impacting on their, on their teams. Um, HR of, of a, num a number of other sorts of um, constraints. But to answer your question, Oscar, where, where's, where's this gonna go? Um, hopefully it's going to be about insight and practical change. Um, I think I am now less guilty about thinking about types, uh, um, and I'm interested more about and more about uh, traits. So it's the individual nuances of traits rather than pigeonholing people as as a type. I think that is where behaviours and certainly oxyc is going, which has got to be useful. Um, and of course, we don't know where we're going. We didn't know twelve months ago almost overnight we were all going to be working from home. Um, God knows what the next crisis is going to be and how we will need to, uh, to, to change that. Um, so there'll be stuff that will happen we have not got a clue about um, and we may or may, may not be able to adapt to that with a bit more thinking, a bit more science. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I, I think that that idea of uh, classic contemporary contextual and and a, and a re uh, a reappraisal and, and a reimagination and a revaluation of, of contextual is is necessary. We've gone too much down the okay. This is what everybody needs to behave like. This is what everyone needs to look like. This is this is the behavior. That, so I think you're absolutely right. So I've got two more questions, and the first one sort of relates to that. So the first one is. The way you've discussed this throughout throughout this chat is it was almost a transformational leap for you because you said you you, you seem to have been very different in, in a part of your career than, than the way you're thinking now. What happened? Where where, where did that come from? Um, like 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 all good change uh, uh, incentives is failure. So when when you keep going at this. Uh, and you keep failing, then eventually you realize, well, something, something's not happening here. Um, now I'm very resilient and um, my wife would call me stubborn. Um, and therefore I, I've kept going at this for years and years and years, as have my colleagues, as have my profession. Um, and look, you, you can't point to a tipping point, but there was a, a slow realization that well, this stuff ain't working. And there's so many, there's only so many times you can blame my ma ma line managers for not buying into things or not implementing it. Actually, there's a realization that this stuff, that stuff doesn't, doesn't work. Um, and if I had my time again, I would start where I am today, not where I was 30 years ago. Um, and I guess that the passion comes from being a convert. Um, so, We've had, we've spent too much time, I've spent too much time um, fl flogging a dead horse, frankly. Um, and, and that's why I'm so passionate about looking at new ways of, of thinking, new ways of doing, whilst not checking out the stuff that's worked in the past. It's very personal, yeah. 
Okay, so so that there were there was so, so it happened that there were there were all these moments that added together eventually, and despite your 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 stubborn nature, you you made that jump. And and, and was it was a was there any anxiety in relation to that jump, or, or did it sort of come very naturally? Uh, huge levels of, of, of anxiety, you know, project by project, project by project. I've, I've worked I've worked with some really great people, um, uh, particularly within the traffic warden um, environment. Um, and my team are bringing me these ideas, um, particularly one guy, Barry Hopley. Um, and um, Barry was somebody who um, yeah, uh, embodied the, the self-value, the confidence to do that. Um, and I did, I was still racking with my own insecurities. Um, so um, the, the self-doubt, the insecurity was, was my own. Uh, and again, that, that's why I see the power of this stuff. Um, in in going beyond your own insecurities and, and having a go and and learning and moving on. So now this, this brings me to my last question, the nine trillion dollar question, Marion, where where you know the, given given how much revenue is lost by by not becoming contextual, and I think in the the language we're using here, um, what what would the outcome be to organisations if every chief HR or chief people and culture officer could make this transformational leap? Um, that's got a great, great question. I think behaviours and self-value is, is part only of what we're, what we're doing. So if, if you were to take all of the jigsaw pieces of all of the positive different ways of thinking seeing that we've seen in the last 12 months in the drinking dialogues and, and, you, and you patchworked all this together uh, then that would be truly transformation transformatory um, so behaviors will play a part um, but it plays a part in enabling adaptive systems an egoless environment uh, a a more indigenous holistic way of thinking and all, and all those we those wellness initiatives that we've that we've talked about and, and, and shared over the last couple of weeks so if we get all of that together um then we we, we we're going to be better and look this this is a commercial play this isn't just about people being better and more well uh, if you get this right, you are going to make profit. And therefore, if you're operating in that environment, uh, you are going to be a more profitable company, servicing customers better, doing what they want to do better, without all of the bollocks of silos and inter interfighting uh, and disengagement. So as a society, if we're going to benefit from being more well as employees, more satisfied as customers, um, we're also going to be more um, better shareholders and, and benefit from a, a stronger economy. Very idealistic, very big picture. We may well never get there, um, but I think your know, behaviours and security will play a part in, in, in the onward journey towards something better. I think you've you've described what Oscar and I try and do better than we can. You know, trying to create this jigsaw and, and quilt of all of these pieces in, in, in something that's synthetic and meaningful uh, and, and can attract people to do the kind of work that, that you've just talked about. I mean that that's that's our passion, I think. Um, and uh, you've probably described it better than I've ever tried to describe it myself. So thank you for that, Marion. Uh, not at all. I, I, I think the, the other great advocate here is Becky. You know, Becky talks about the collisions we have in these conversations um, and, and what comes from that collision, those synthesis. That's hugely powerful. But thank you. Thanks a lot, Marion. Um, I'd also uh, like to uh, thank Richard on the other side. Uh, yeah, it was another fantastic conversation uh, of today. Cool. Um, and I'll see you soon. Great. Thanks, guys. Cheers.